there, guys. This is Rita. This is Amanda. And this is I Don't, I don't know, know Her, the podcast about women that you probably don't know about. But you will today. And you should, and you will. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to like like uh mix up our intro and it's yeah. been really funny. <laughs> it's been funny, but it's like I like it. Like I remember the first time we did it, it was like, oh, mm, it was done. And then now on. I'm being, I'm too confident. I'm caught. <laughs> I'm cocky. You're too confident. I'm too confident. Yeah. I, I see. Mm-hmm. So uh, before we started, Rita was like, what should we gab about before we record? Like before we actually start our women. And I, I strategically was like, we need to talk about Castor Semenya. Okay. And I don't know what this is about. So I, I bet you do if I like, Go into refresh it. your memory. All right. So Castor is a South African track runner. Okay. Now, now I know. Now I know. <laughs> She's doing the nod. Yeah. Uh, so Castor is an incredibly talented athlete, female runner from South Africa. And over the years, she's been scrutinized and accused of being a man multiple times. Okay. And she, and, and part, part of that is because she's extremely fast mm-hmm. and blows everybody out of the water when she's in a competition. And so the Olympic committee or whatever did like a blood test on her. And she has higher levels of testosterone than most women. Okay. So they set a limit on the amount of testosterone a woman is allowed to have in order to compete in women's sports. Was this um, was this already established before her or did this get established because of her? I'm actually not clear on that because okay. uh, and the reason I wanted to bring it up is because the person I'm talking about today has something to do with that. Oh, Okay. So I know that there were, there were, there are rules. There are like rules about what a gender is, which I think is crazy in this mm-hmm. day and age, but they had like very specific prescriptions that say like, this is what a woman has to be in her like hormonal levels and so on and so forth. And Castor's testor- testosterone level is above whatever they have set as the limit that you can have to be considered a woman. Okay. Which is bananas because there are all kinds of reasons that people have different levels of hormones yeah abby has a higher level of testosterone than most women do but she's obviously a woman yeah i'm fairly sure i probably do too (laughs) (laughs) yeah and uh so she is now under orders like if she wants to compete in women's events she has to do something to lower her testosterone level how do you do that or compete in men's sports or in a whole special league for okay. people who are like intersex and trans. Is there a league like that? I don't think so. Not okay. at the Olympic level. No. There's no division for mm-hmm. people who are intersex and trans. But too, if she goes and competes with men who might have twice the exactly. testosterone that she has, she's not going to have a chance. Yeah. She can't compete against them. Yeah. Yeah. So basically she has to alter her own natural body chemistry in order to compete in the sport that she loves and dominates. Would she have to take estrogen or something or I'm I don't under- even know what I don't that know would entail. How you do that. Like I think she would have to take more estrogen, but I'm not like I don't know if it's like a ratio thing like it has to be this percentage yeah. of t- or the estrogen or if it has to be, to be like an actual level yeah. like You can't have this many parts per million in your blood or whatever. So whatever it is, it's extremely discriminatory. Highly discriminatory. And it's so like, hmm, you are a little too good. Let's figure out what's wrong with you so that we can not validate your accomplishment. (laughs) Right. That's how I see it. It's like, you're too good at this competition. We need to kick you out. We need to find a reason. Mm -hmm. And she is a very tall masculine presenting woman with a deep voice. I don't know what that means. And it's none of my fucking business. Like I don't, she is in the women's division. She is as far as I know, biologically female, not that that would matter either. Mm -mm. I mean, we need to really figure out. And I think pretty soon what it is we're going to do about sports when it comes to gender as someone who understands the need for title nine, which mm-hmm. was the rule that was passed to make sports equally accessible to girls. I understand that there needs to be some lines drawn 
and currently this is getting a little bit fuzzy. Like, so at the middle school level in the league that my school com- competes in, mm-hmm. there is girls tennis, but no boys tennis. Okay. And so the boys don't get to play volleyball and they don't get to play tennis because there aren't boys volleyball teams. There's no boys tennis team at, at the middle school level. But girl, so the, and the boys are not allowed to play on the girls teams, okay. but the girls are allowed to play on the boys teams. So there are girls that play baseball with the boys and play football with the, with the boys as well. Mm-hmm. But the boys aren't allowed to play tennis with the girls and so on and so forth. Strange. <sighs> Yeah, it is and it isn't. So there's a team we compete against. So our middle school tra- tennis team is gigantic. It's like 60 girls. Oh my goodness. That's I know. a lot. It's a lot. And they have, whenever they go to play other teams, there are never as many girls. Like they might have 20. Hmm. <laughs> and so this one of the other schools in the league was like, we're going to let our boys play. And so these boys have been signing up and then they go, our girls go and compete against them and can't even, can't even kind of compete. Yeah. Cause the boys are taller. They can hit faster and stronger. Yeah. So I understand that there's an imbalance there and that sucks, but I don't know what the answer is. I don't know either. If we decide that gender is a construct that we've created and there is no such like line and there are people who identify as non-binary and people who are intersex and people who are trans and we're fussing about who gets to play what sport and how fair is how, how fair is fair. I don't, we're on like a collision course with this, like mm-hmm. socially and athletically. And I think Castor is like the first person that's going to be the really? person that we, that we're going to base this test case on. Yeah. And start the dialogue. Yeah. Well, what do you think? I mean, your kid plays sports. Well, so Isai is, my son is a wrestler and wrestling is a very intense sport and it's, it's pretty physically daunting and he's hurt a couple of people just cause he is, he's really strong. He's a really strong boy. I actually had an incident with him like last summer of, uh, remember when he, <laughs> he uh, tackled me to the floor in a head and arm and ripped out one of my piercings in my ear Yeah, and I was like in tears and he didn't mean to do it. We were just like, I started play fighting with him and that kid is strong. So he's got, uh, girls can wrestle. Yeah. And so there's been girls that he's wrestled and he'll kind of look at us like, do I, do I take it easier or do I, do I just full on? Like if I was wrestling another boy, and he he's wrestled some girls and he's hurt some girls. And I said, well, in my opinion, it's like if if it's an a playing field where she's going to be there and he's going to be there and they're in the same weight class. And they're class. in the same weight class. Um, you're assuming some risks when you do that. Yeah. And I said she's here to compete too, so if you take it easy on her, you're you're taking away from her real yeah, competition. Exactly. Um, I'm not, you know, we we don't teach out and out, you know, sweep the leg kind of stuff. Um, that's just poor sportsmanship. And there's parents out there who do do that. And that's, uh, that's bullshit. Um, but I feel like if there's um, an understanding when you're both coming into the competition, I feel like that's okay. But this whole thing with like, like you said, with the tennis, I don't know what to do with that because yeah, cause boys aren't a lot like they want to play tennis. They don't want to play. Yeah. They want, they don't want to be in track and they don't want to be in baseball. They want to play tennis. Mm-hmm. And at high school, there are boys tennis teams. So if you're a middle school student and you want to start playing tennis, you have to wait till high school. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think that's very fair either. I don't think to that's me that's fair. very unfair. Mm-hmm. And if we're trying to make things more fair, then there should be a boys tennis team. Yeah. There should be options. And the, and the, and the justification for not having it is that, well, the boys can be on track. So they've got that team. Boys can play baseball. They've got that team. So mm-hmm. we have to have an equal number of spring sports for girls. Mm-hmm. Girls can be on track. So that's their, that's their other one. So they needed one more. So it's tennis. Well, if you allow boys to play tennis, then they have three sports that they can play. And girls will only have two. Hmm. And that's why the boys aren't allowed to play it. Yeah. At the middle school. So, I mean, I understand why they don't have the boys play, but that sucks. It's not a good solution. Yeah. 
smarter people than me need to come up with solutions to this stuff. <laughs> yeah. I was, was going to say, you mentioned wrestling. I, I think it was in Missouri, perhaps. There was this trans boy. And meaning transitioned, like taking testosterone, okay. wanted to compete with boys, and they wouldn't let him. Really? And so he would blow the girls out of the water and just sweep entire tournaments. And at state, you know, pinned at like in the final championship match, pinned in immediately, like in 10 seconds, mm-hmm. won state and was booed by the crowd. Wow. And how is that fair? And he didn't want to compete against girls. No. He wanted to compete against boys. And he would have been at a disadvantage in the boys league because he hadn't been taking testosterone for a long time. Mm-hmm. It had been like a year or so. So like he would have had a chance because he was a talented wrestler, but probably wouldn't have been state champ. But because they wouldn't let him compete with boys, mm-hmm. then he, he at all of these coaches athletes parents were pissed they were like he is at an advantage and it's not fair to these girls true Mm -hmm. it wasn't but don't blame the kid the kid didn't do anything wrong don't boo the kid imagine the kind of emotional damage that that causes in a child i know i was i was appalled like if you are an adult Booing a child at a sporting event, you need to reevaluate your life choices. Oh no, the wrestling is a whole new world to me. I was I was not raised in a very sporty family. Um, actually, was very um, almost like discouraged (laughs) to play (laughs) sports. Um, we just we didn't have the money for it, and we didn't have the time. You know, my parents were like, "We do not need one more thing." Um. But we, they did put us in, you know, my brothers played football. My sisters played tennis. Um, I was a cheerleader for like a hot minute. I played basketball for a really long time. So we did play some things. Um, but it was, my parents were never those parents that were like, you know, go fight, win and screaming at their kids from the sidelines and at every game. And, you know, they had t-shirts with their kids' names and faces on it. And it's like, <laughs> there's wrestling, like this wrestling world is some of these people are, are insane. Yeah, some of them are a little nuts. There's a mom that she was yelling at her son from the bleachers so loud I could hear her from across the gymnasium, a full gym of like 300 screaming adults and kids. And I could hear her barking and she's cussing at her kid. And I was like, how is that okay? I was like, somebody needs to get on that. There's judges and people and coaches that are just like, geez, what's that lady's problem? And it's like, why don't you go address it? Like you're allowing that to happen. It's disgusting. And my, so our son used to wrestle as well. And I was appalled by wrestling culture in general Mm -hmm. when I started being like at these matches and stuff. And I would see the way the kids acted, Mm -hmm. the way parents acted. Like I saw a kid um, who lost a match walk off and take his helmet off and throw it against the wall. It bounced off the wall and hit an adult. Oh, jeez. And I was like, I'm sorry, that's a fireable offense. (laughs) Like you cannot behave that way. Like you, I don't, if you were a basketball player who did something like that Mm -hmm. or a football player. Oh, and I, and, and it's obvious. It goes without saying that white kids and white athletes get away with so much more Mm. than brown kids and black kids. Like I was just listening to the radio the other day talking about how the new thing that's happening a lot in NBA games is like fans that can sit really close to the athletes on the floor are like berating them and saying shit to them and trying to stir up shit and get them to respond. Oh, wow. And like there was this one man who one white guy who was like basically saying racist shit to a black NBA player. And the NBA player, like, finally, like, lost his cool. Because it's, like, it's as close as you and I are mm-hmm. to each other. You can't. You can't That's do his that. job. Yeah. I don't go to your job <laughs> and scream shit at you. Yeah, exactly. And, th- and sometimes throw things. People get weird about sports. They I do. don't know. Our sports culture needs to be, like, real the fuck in. Maybe this is what it is. It's time. Time for things to change. 
and I, for a long time, like I at Russell, like I'll go to his matches. I don't go to practice because it is so much, and it's I so I get to a go little to practice. Parents going to practice as a coach, I'm like, what the fuck why are, are you, you here? doing? Here? And that's how I feel. I'm like, this is coach's time, yeah, and you need to respect your coach as an authority figure. And um, it's not my job to sit there and be trying to coach you. It's n- not my job. Backseat coaching is what exactly. it is. And I cannot stand it. No. In fact, just this last week or two two weeks ago, we had a parent after a meet posted on Facebook about how all of the co- – me and my fellow <laughs> coaches that we didn't know we were doing what? posted on Facebook. So a friend of mine who's friends with this parent screenshot it and sent it to me. So I sent it on to the rest of the coaches. Oh, my gosh. So our head coach wrote him an email and was like, hey, buddy. You want to come? You want to come in and talk to me about your feelings? <laughs> We'd love to chat. Wow! And he never responded. Of course not. And then, a, like a day after that, wrote a status. It was like, "Don't you just love tattletale adults?" I was like, "Wait, who's not the adult in the room, motherfucker? You're the one who wouldn't even respond to a fucking email. Don't talk to me about being a child." Oh my god! Good grief! Good lord! Anyway, yeah. So on to my person who is an athlete. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, kids. And I don't want to make it like obviously I'm a coach. I coach two sports and I really like coaching and I like sports. Mm-hmm. I think it's good for students, some students, not everyone, to be in and to be involved in. But I think that we need to really sit down and take a hard look at ourselves as yeah. a culture and the way we treat athletes, the mm-hmm. way we push people. Like I have such a huge problem with football right now and I I can't even watch it. I don't go to football games. I don't watch football games. I don't talk about football anymore Mm -hmm. because I think the whole complex and the NBA is becoming similar is extremely racist. It's set up to use and abuse the bodies of brown and black people Mm -hmm. and profit off of them and then leave them broken on the side of the road. I struggle with that so much because I'm like, I know my son's an amazing athlete and he's got a lot of talent Mm -hmm. and people see that, especially people in schools around here that have money. Yeah. And they want him to come play for them. And they want him and they're willing to pay for his education. And I'm like, uh, but he's my son. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, a precious body to me right there. And I would really, really, you know, fall apart if something really, really bad happened to him. So my son is, or my husband actually is his, one of his coaches in wrestling and in football. And he said the only way that he'll still have him in football, if he's there watching to make sure, um, cause my husband coached football for nine years, he coached uh, middle school and he coached high school for six. And he's really about safety yeah. and there's coaches out there who don't give a shit and he's like no and yeah. he'll call people out on that and he makes sure that safety first safety first he said he gets so annoyed when kids don't tie their shoes properly he's like you're gonna snap your ankle and you're never gonna play again so he'd always make sure check everybody's shoes make sure everybody's gear is on right make sure you have the right size helmet mm. yeah so I'd, yeah the, I like the kids who have helmets on that are way too big for their heads yeah I'm like that's not gonna do anything It's not going to save you from a head injury. Nope. Okay. Yep. Enough about that rant. (laughs) So I am talking about an athlete today. And um, the reason I'm talking about this person today is because a friend of mine, a co-coach of mine. Okay. Who also used to be a teaching partner of mine was like hounding me. She was like, you have to talk about this woman. You have to talk about this woman. Have you heard of her? You should have heard of her. She was like, I'm so glad you did Wilma Rudolph, but do you know who set the record before <laughs> Wilma Rudolph? Oh. And I was like, I don't actually. <laughs> You're like backed up against a wall. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't know her and uh, now I do. And her name is Helen Stevens. I don't know her. Well, she was the fastest woman in the world until w- Wilma Rudolph. <laughs> and she never lost a race in her whoa. life. Oh, whoa. Okay. Yeah. Are you ready? Ready. Helen Herring Stevens was born February 3rd, 1918 to Frank and Bertie May Stevens near Fulton, Missouri. She grew up on a 100 acre farm in Callaway County, and she had just one young, younger brother named Robert. She was really tall and eventually would grow to be over six feet. I was going to say, how tall was she? Yeah. Was, so she was really, foot? yeah. When she was an adult woman, she was over six feet tall. Wow. She was very slender and athletic. 
and she loved to race boys. <laughs> Speaking of gender, she loved to race boys. Uh, she There was a mile long trek that she would make to and from school. And so she would race boys on this mile and win. She won every single time. There was not a boy in her school who could beat her. Oh, wow. And she was also frequently like would her, her cousin lived down the road and he would get on his horse and trot to school. Oh. And so she would jog alongside or run alongside the horse. Okay. To go to school because she liked running. <laughs> yeah. So this is a great little exercise. <laughs> <laughs> um, which This is what Helen said about growing up on a farm. From the time I was a small child, I was in training. Only I didn't know it. I was walking, running, doing chores, building up my body, my lung capacity, my wind, my endurance, everything that people have to train for today. Mm. We talked about what that with Grandma Gatewood. Yeah. She had that same thing, like her life as uh, doing hard labor on a farm mm -hmm. prepared her to do this hard labor of walking the AT. So she also was taught how to use a rifle. Nice. But she was like, man... Anybody can shoot a gun <laughs> to kill a rabbit. I'm going to chase it down. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she would run them down and chase them. Oh, my gosh. And catch them by and hand. And catch rabbits? By hand, yeah. Holy crap. That's how fast she was. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she attended a one-room school called Middle River School and then went on to go to high school in Fulton, which was the n nearest town. Neither of her schools had athletic teams or facilities for girls. Of course not. <laughs> so she couldn't join a track team to fulfill her dream of being the fastest woman in the world. Like she started to have this, she had like a dream when she was in middle school that she was going to become the fastest woman in the world. And that's, so after that dream, she wanted to achieve this, but she couldn't even compete in track. <laughs> so in 1934, at the age of 15, Helen ran the 50 meter dash in PE class. Right. The teacher, who was a coach, his name was Burton W. Moore, he used his watch and he clocked her at 5.8 seconds. Whoa. And he was blown away because at that time, her 5.8 seconds matched the current world record. Oh, my gosh. Which had been set by a woman named Elizabeth Robinson. So he had to run it again because he was like, that's no way that that was right. So he had her run the 50 meter dash again. This time she ran it in 5.9 seconds. Oh. He still was like, there's no fucking way that this yeah, is this teenager, 15 year old girl's time. So he took his watch to a jeweler <laughs> to verify that it was keeping correct time. And it was. I, would, I wonder if it was a boy. They'd just be like, whoa, look how fast he is. Whoa. And then like, no, let's get the watch checked. <laughs> well, I don't think so, because as soon as he was verified that that was that his watch was correct, there was no discrepancy. Okay. He was like, I want to coach you. Her. Okay. So for them, from then on, he made it his mission to train Helen to become a competitive athlete. Oh, wow. So the two of them would meet at the Westminster College track, where she trained with the high school and college men's teams. And she's a teenager. She's a teenage time. girl. That's there's amazing. That's no, so cool. There's no women's teams for her to be on. Her first major competition took place the following summer in 1935 at the Amateur Athletic Union, AAU, Indoor Championships in St. Louis. Helen was just 17 years old at the time. She didn't have any proper gear. She had to borrow a sweatshirt and spikes from a male teammate. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and the place was packed with fans who had come to see a gold medalist there who was named Stella Walsh. And at the time, Stella was the fastest woman in the world. Stella was a, that was a woman? Mm -hmm. Stella Walsh. So she had set world records in almost every event in which she had run. So she... Helen was in running events, but she was also doing some field events. She okay. did the shot put and the standing broad jump, which no longer exists. Now we have the long jump. Oh, where you okay. Run and jump. But yeah. The standing broad jump for, for women was you would stand and then you just jump into the pit. <laughs> <laughs> so she was competing in those events as well. And she was talented in those events, but her favorite was to sprint. So in the 50 meter sprint, she blew past gold medalist world record holder Stella Walsh and won with a time of 6.6 .6 seconds. Whoa. Which is setting a new U.S. record. Oh. When she was being congratulated for beating Stella Walsh, she joked, Who's Stella Walsh? <gasps> shade. Oh. Mad shade. 
She said, I don't know her. <laughs> she totally did. She pulled a Mariah Carey. I don't know her. Stella was pissed. <laughs> I would be too. <laughs> so afterwards when like the reporters were like, what do you think of her, you know, slighting you? She was like, <laughs> she called Helen the, that greenie from the sticks. Oh, and the two runners from then on were engaged in a career long grudge. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> it's always nice to have a good uh, grudge. You know, I love women supporting women, but I do like a cat fight once in a while. <laughs> and you never know if those things are real, anyway. Yeah, like I, you probably never really got into WWE, did you? No, <laughs> <laughs> I was really into it when I was little. Okay, friend fact. <laughs> Yes, friend fact. I was really into it when I was little because I loved the drama. <laughs> there was always somebody who was having a grudge with this person. Somebody turned evil on this match. <laughs> they were normally this nice guy. Betrayed. And and I just, I lived for the drama. I lived for it. <laughs> and like they would have these grudges. You know, it'd be like these two people would be against each other forever. Yeah. And so then when they would meet in the ring and they'd be like fuming at each other. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, I don't know if, if their grudge was real, but it does seem that way, especially later on with some of the stuff that Stella pulls. Okay. <laughs> so um, after this championship, Helen became known as the Fulton Flash and also was sometimes called the Missouri Express for how fast Those are was. cool names. I, like I, that. Yeah, I agree. At the Missouri Indoor Interscholastic Championships that year, Helen set a new world record for the 50-meter dash with a time of 5.9 seconds. That is so fast. However, that time was disqualified for because she used blocks. Well, um, so underneath her feet when she started? Yeah. Yeah. And that's like standard now. Everybody's in blocks. Like we don't even, we have kids in the middle school, right? And yeah. When they when they first start running track, the blocks make them feel really uncomfortable, Mm -hmm. but it's, it makes you so much faster. Like you get out of the gate so much faster than if you just try to run from standing. Yeah. So, uh, it's just crazy to me that her time was disqualified because she was in blocks. Well, did she know that were they not allowed and she didn't know that? I have no idea why. I I, I can't imagine a coach would put her in blocks and then be like, Oh, what? You can't accept it. I don't know if they were just trying to find a way to disqualify our time. Yeah. That sounds odd because if you were setting up on blocks, your coach would know. Your coach would know if those were allowed or not. And remember when Wilma set that one record, they were like, no, you were aided, aided by the by wind. The wind. <laughs> and, and that happens a lot. I've discovered as I've like been researching these athletes. Hmm. So at the Missouri Outdoor Championships, she set a high school world record for the 50 meter dash and matched the world record for the 100-meter dash at 10.8 seconds. Wow. Yeah, 100-meter dash in 10.8 seconds. That's oh, fast. It's so fast. So fast. She graduated from Fulton High School that spring and spent the summer running races around the U.S. and Canada competitively. She set a number of new U.S. records and never lost a single race. And then she went on to go to William Woods College, which is, which is in Florissant. Florissant? Okay. <laughs> Helen went to William Woods College in Florissant, Missouri in 1935, and immediately her focus is on quali- qualifying for and attending the 1936 Berlin Olympics. Okay. At the Olympic trials in June, Helen took first place in the 100-meter dash, the shot put, and the discus, paving Jeez. the way for her Olympic dream, and she was just 18. Wow, she's clean sweep. Yes. <laughs> clean sweep for her. Helen would be matched again with Stella Walsh. (laughs) Stella had been avoiding all AAU competitions for a year because that, that Helen was in yeah, because she didn't want to be defeated again by her. Okay. Though she lived and trained in the U S Stella was actually born in Poland. And so for the Olympics, she was going to be running for the Polish national team. Okay. In the preliminary 100 meter heat, Helen broke Stella's world record of 11.8 seconds by four tenth of a second, finishing in 11.4 seconds. Wow. Though her time was below the world record, the judges determined she had been aided by a strong tailwind and did not accept her time as the new record. (laughs) That is so just like, that's bullshit. I know. I mean, can you really, whatever. (laughs) In the final heat. Okay. Helen ran past all of her competition, completing the race in 11.5 seconds, winning her a gold medal and officially setting a new world record. Okay. 
So she's still got she's her still world getting record. it. Yeah. Helen was also the anchor in the four by one hundred relay. In the qualifying round, the German relay team had set a world record, and it was just like, oh, obviously they didn't stand a chance against this German team. Mm -hmm. However, during the (laughs) final heat, one of the German racers dropped the baton and the team was disqualified. (gasps) Ooh, rookie mistake. And so the U.S. team won by less than a second, making Helen Stevens a two-time gold medalist. Nice. And the relay team also set a world record at 46.9 seconds. Wow. So Helen became the fastest woman in the world, her dream a record that she held for 24 years until Wilma Rudolph shattered her records at the 1960 Olympics. Oh, this is 24 years before Wilma. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. So Helen Stevens is the one who set these records. Okay. So notice what game she was at. The Olympics that mm-hmm. she was at? Yeah. Berlin. Yes. 1936. Yeah. Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> so after the medals, medal ceremony, Adolf Hitler invited her into his private box. Ew. She was the only American athlete to be recognized by him. She asked for his autograph, which he gave. And this is what she said of the moment when he, when they met, he comes in and gives me the Nazi salute. And I gave him a good old fashioned Missouri handshake. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'm not going to do that. (laughs) Then Hitler gets hold of my fanny and begins to squeeze and pinch and hug me up. And he said, you're a true Aryan type. You should be running for Germany. Ew. So after he gave me a once over and a full massage, he asked me if I'd like to spend the weekend in Berchtesgaden. She declined the offer. Yeah. So I'm going to stop for a second. Gross. So the whole reason I did, I said that I was doing this woman is because I had a friend who, who wanted me to. Yeah. Well, the reason my friend wanted me to do Helen is because she knew her personally. Oh. Yeah. So this is what she said. Um, My friend, Julie Scott, is a track coach and a teacher. And she was a track athlete in Missouri when Helen Stevens was living there. Oh, wow. She was running college for uh, college track for Park College in Parkville, Missouri. They were a small college and they would often warm up and stretch with the William Woods College team that Helen Stevens had originally been on. Okay. And she had started coaching them. And so my friend met her and she told this story about the 1936 Berlin Olympics. So I told you the stuff about him greeting her Mm. and all of that stuff. But another story about that time is she was invited to a party at a castle owned by Joseph Goebbels, who was the minister of propaganda. Oh, yeah. And it was being put on by Goebbels and Hermann Goring, who was like the architect of the yeah. final solution. Yes. So Goring asked to see Helen and she was taken into a room where he was sitting in a chair with a drink in his hand and nothing on but a bathrobe with his thigh exposed. He greeted her, kissed her hand and asked her to have a drink with him in his private quarters to talk. She said that he really made her uncomfortable Freaked her out and she backed away saying, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. He grabbed her wrist and she's at this point freaked out. Like something's going to happen. But then someone came in and said he had a phone call and he had to leave. She then left and left with all of these other athletes and their escorts. And my friend said at the time when Helen told her this story, she was like, there's no way this is true. She's just telling a tall tale. She's Mm -hmm. stretching the truth. She's just trying to be like telling cool stories but then um, later on, when Helen Stevens actually had her biography written by a journalist called The Life of Helen, The Fulton Flash, The Life of Helen Stevens, mm-hmm. the, this woman fact checked everything. And like there were other athletes that had been at this party. There were other athletes that had been in the box that Hitler was in and like could verify that everything oh, she whoa. said had happened. Yeah. So uh, she also said that this woman was just like, really an incredible person. She just was like really outgoing, extremely imposing figure was so tall and just seemed like she knew that she was destined to be an important mm-hmm. person. So I just wanted to throw in that little thing about the Berlin Olympics. Cause that was crazy. That's crazy. And it's almost like they were fascinated by her abilities because they were all about that perfection, that strong, you know, the German. strong and the, disgusting people. I know. I know. 
As if you didn't need an, um, another reason to hate Nazis. <laughs> right. Okay. So, meanwhile, Stella Walsh, right? Mm-hmm. She's pissed. She's like, I'm not going down without a fight here. <laughs> this woman has beaten all my records, has stolen my trophies, has stolen my medals. <laughs> Bitch is going down. <laughs> so, she declared publicly that she thought Helen was a man. Oh, my gosh. Okay. That's why I want to talk about Caster. Okay. Um, because no woman could run as fast as Helen did. So ha- Helen was like, okay, I'll do a physical. So oh she goodness. volunteered for a physical exam by German officials who verified that she was biologically female. <laughs> Ironically, years later, Stella Walsh was a bystander in a robbery and was shot and killed. What? An autopsy was performed on her and showed that Walsh had a genetic condition called mosaicism, which meant that she had a mostly male chromosome balance and would technically be considered male under the Olympic rules. What? Yeah. This is crazy. (laughs) This is cuckoo birds fucking weird crazy. (laughs) So the woman who was like, she's a man, was the one who would have been, if they, if she had... If she had submitted to testing, she would have, she been, would have been stripped of her medals and records. <laughs> Which, again, is all bullshit and shouldn't be happening to Castor no. or Helen or Stella. But nonetheless, I find it ironic. Yes. <laughs> she was the yeah. one <laughs> demanding this. And then she's the one who's got the male chromosome. Wow. So after the Olympics, Helen returned to Missouri and finished her degree in 1937. She and Jesse Owens, who was the African-American athlete from the U.S. who also broke all the records and won all the medals and Hitler refused Mm -hmm. to acknowledge because he was black. Yeah. They uh, embarked on a headline U S tour for a few months together. And then she got a job at a sports clothing company in St. Louis and they had a softball team that she played on. She was like an incredible athlete. She could do shot all around. Yeah. Disc is broad standing jump, whatever. Um, so she also then signed on to play professional basketball for a team called the all American redheads after a year of playing on this team, which was owned by someone else. She was like, you know what? I think I want to create my own basketball team. So in 1938, she created the Helen Stevens Olympic co-eds at just 20 years old. Helen became the first woman to create own and manage a semi-pro basketball team. Wow. She's so young too. They barnstormed the U S and Canada playing men's teams. She also ended up playing semi-pro softball and coached, managed, and owned some softball teams. In addition to her own teams, she also performed in exhibition games with the House of David team. Remember Jackie Mitchell? Yeah. She was on a House of David team. Oh, okay. And I was like, wait, Helen was also on a House of David team? (laughs) How big was this team? (laughs) Like, how, How big were these people into sports? Yeah. So during halftime, so remember those were, those games were like crazy shit would happen. Yeah. The house of David people were the ones that had all the beards. And so once sometimes Jackie would put a beard on when she played baseball with them. So in, so did she have to do, she didn't know that she didn't do the beard thing, but she was still doing like show stuff. So okay. during halftime, she would challenge men in the audience to foot races. Oh my gosh. And other demonstrations of her prowess, her athletic prowess. And the men would take her up on the offer and they always lost, obviously. (laughs) Fun was had by all. (laughs) She also did like discus, you know, she'd be like, oh, I challenge any man in here to try to throw the discus farther than me. Nice. And like, that's one that she could have definitely lost. She didn't. (laughs) Which is why I love her. Yeah. She actually put a pause on her basketball team during World War II because she joined the Women's Reserve of the U.S. Marines. Whoa. And I know. She was just like, <laughs> I'll do everything. I'm going to do it all. After the war was over, she began working for the Air Force's Defense Mapping Agency Aerospace Center, where she served as a librarian. And she retired in 1976, but then took a part time job coaching the William Woods track team. And that's when my friend Julie Scott met her. Wow. It was okay. in this time when yeah. she was working as a coach for the William Woods team. Helen herself never stopped running. Jeez. She competed in the Senior Olympics multiple times. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> and never lost a race, maintaining her perfect record for life. In fact, at age 68, she ran the 100-meter dash in 16.4 seconds, just four seconds slower than she did when she was 18. Jeez. Mm-hmm. 
Where does this girl come from, man? Good stock. <laughs> yeah, that's good farm stock in Missouri. <laughs> she lived in Missouri with her partner, Mabel Robb, a dietitian who died in 1986. And Julie told me that she was pretty openly a lesbian. Really? Even at the time when Julie was running college or running track in Missouri. Wow. So from 1980 until her death, she was actually on the board of the Senior Olympics. And she also participated in a ton of other, she was on the board of tons of things, was super involved with Senior Olympics and other running events for older people. Hmm. Helen Stevens died on January 17th, 1994 at the age of 75. Yeah, nice long life. She, and apparently she was like a diehard smoker. Like Julie, what? T- <laughs> Julie told me that she was never without a cigarette in her hand. My gosh, some people can just do that. How, and I'm like, well, maybe if you hadn't been a smoker, you would have actually tied your record when <laughs> you were 68 rather than running it. We all got to have a vice in some way. Helen, after her death, was inducted into the U.S. Track and Field Hall of Fame, the National Track and Field Hall of Fame, the National Women's Hall of Fame, and many, many others. But I didn't even know her name. I Not even on my radar. Nope. Not at all. But she was a fun story. That is a great story. I like that one. Yeah. I really liked that there was something personal to add to it from my friend. Yeah, that's crazy. I think that's neat. I just think it's neat when you know somebody. Yeah. When you've got a personal connection. I mean, I personally obviously don't have a connection, but I mean, somebody <laughs> but in, else. in a way, you know. Yeah. Somebody yeah. else had this personal First-hand connection. First-hand experience. Yeah. And she she just had, she said she was just this larger than life personality, just smoking and <laughs> had this like husky voice and was so tall. And <laughs> I like this lady. I can't wait to see what she looks like. Yeah. 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 It's, she's pretty neat looking. I mean, she's just like everything you might imagine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who do you got for me? Okay, so this is crazy. I have an athlete too. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> I know. My mind is blown right now that we're like, I, we're, we're all, always we, on the same thread just a little bit. Yeah, we got like brain connections something, here. Something. All right. So do you know Barbara Butrick? No, I don't. Not at all. I was really, when you started to say Barbara, I was like, I know who this is. <laughs> it was not who I thought. She is the first official U.S. women's boxing champion. Boxing? <laughs> I know. Now we're going to talk about women who are playing in men dominated, like male dominated fields. That's, this is crazy. This is so crazy. All right. Well, I can't believe we started. We have a whole themed episode <laughs> by accident. By accident. Per, per happen chance. So I'm going to go into a little bit of just a little history of women's boxing. Uh, so women's boxing goes back as far as the late 1700s. Uh, the earliest, yeah, the earliest fight was documented in London in 1722. Elizabeth Wilkinson challenged Hannah Hayfield in a local newspaper, and it was printed as I, Elizabeth Wilkinson, having some words with Hannah Hayfield <laughs> and requiring satisfaction, do invite her to meet me on the stage and box me. <laughs> She's like, like, bitch. <laughs> that is like when you were a kid and you were like, I'm going to fight you at lunch. Yeah. Meet me at the rock yeah. by, by, by the, the old set. <laughs> by the old tree that yeah. has my name carved in it. Yeah. It's, it was very like formal. We, we briefly had a fight club when I was in middle school. Oh, I remember going out and my first fight, I was probably like eight or nine and it was the back, uh, the neighbors that lived behind us. And it was two brothers and a sister. And the sister didn't like me. And so we like went out into like the reeds because they were super tall. And they were like, you guys need to fight. And we were like, <laughs> all right. And so we just kind of stared at each other. And then we just started kicking each other on our shins like really hard. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember I decked her really hard. And my brother came from around the corner and saw us fighting. And he whipped me up. My feet literally picked up off the ground and he dragged me into the house and he threw me in a chair and he got in my face and he said, I don't ever want to see you fighting ever again. And I was crying and I was all ashamed. (laughs) And he's just like, that's not, that's not you. And those kids aren't worth it. He's like, don't be doing that. (laughs) Oh man. I, I mean, so I definitely decked a girl in the face. Well, a couple of girls, but one girl just really fucking deserved it. (laughs) And I had, I have no regrets we had this, I had this friend who was like overweight 
and I mean, she was not like, not that it matters. She wasn't, I don't know why people picked on her. Mm -hmm. She was a little bit different. She'd had a lot of medical problems at some point. So she'd missed a lot of school. And I don't know, her family was just like treated like garbage, like Hmm. her and her siblings. And they were all just such nice people. And there was this younger crowd. So they would really pick on her. They were probably like two or three years younger than us. And it didn't matter because she was just like a pile of goo. Like she just couldn't take it. Mm -hmm. And I would just get so pissed that these people would pick on her. Yeah. And one day she lived really close to our school and it was like a weekend. And so she and I were like, let's go play on the equipment, Mm -hmm. playground equipment. And the ringleader of this like group of meanies also lived fairly close to school. Mm -hmm. So we're just like swinging and like having a good time. We're probably seventh grade, I would say. And these kids roll up and they're like, as soon as we see them, she's like, oh, fuck. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, because she knows they're going to come and make fun of us. And they do. And whatever they say about me, like, oh, you've got glasses and you're goofy looking and you're ugly. (laughs) Yeah, we all are. We're 14. (laughs) We're 13 awkward motherfuckers. Yeah. So, but then they start in on her and they like surround her like literally surround her yeah. and they're like, like, like taking sticks and poking at her fat rolls. And I mean, it was really evil That's type harsh. shit. Yeah. And I just like, she kept being like, cause I would get mad and she'd be like, no, 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 it's fine. We'll just let them and then they'll go mm. away. And I was like, this I, is not fine. I'm not, I, nope, we're not having this anymore. <laughs> so I just walked right up to the ring there and I just went, boom. <laughs> Punched her right in the face, knocked her out onto the ground. And the other kids were like, oh, my God, run away. And then, you know, she sort of sits up and is like bawling and holding her face. And Crystal looks at me and she was like, run. (laughs) (laughs) And we got the fuck out of there. And then it wasn't I mean, it wasn't even 10 minutes that we had gotten back to her house before the phone rang. Oh, yeah. And her mom (laughs) comes down to the basement where we're sitting and she's like did you punch a girl? (laughs) I think your mom needs to come get you. So (laughs) my mom shows up and I get in the car and she's like, did you actually punch a girl who is younger than you? And I was like, yeah, I did that. She was like, what in the hell would possess you to do something like that? So then I tell her the things that this girl was saying and Mm. like what she was doing and they were like poking her with sticks. And she was like, Oh, okay. We're good. <laughs> We're all good here. We're all good now because that girl yeah. really deserved that. I think my actually I should say my first fight was in kindergarten. I punched a boy in the face. And it was because he had hit another little girl. <laughs> and they sent me to the office and they asked, "Why did you hit him?" And I said, "Cuz you're not supposed to hit girls." <laughs> I I I took a boy and slammed him up against the lockers and held him up by his throat. <laughs> Uh, once because he made fun of a fellow classmate because he didn't have a mother. Oh, jeez. Because his mother had died of cancer Christ. when we were in fourth grade. Uh, I would do the same thing. And I was like, you're not no, going to fucking get away with that, no, motherfucker. No, 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 no. <laughs> I've been in, yeah, quite a few fights. I've lost a lot. I've won very little. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, I didn't ever take on the ones I would lose. <laughs> So this is a, so back to the story. This is the first uh, documented uh, fight because yeah, it's in the newspaper. (laughs) So uh, this woman, she ended up winning and she continued fighting both men and women. In those days, the rules of boxing allowed kicking, gouging, other (laughs) methods of attacking, um, not part of today's uh, tactics. (laughs) This is definitely playground fighting. And these were not people of means. Uh, Boxing was mostly in taverns surrounded by prostitutes, alcohol, gambling, and very, very poor people. This was like a way to earn extra money. It was entertainment. It was uh, considered pretty lowly behavior. And that actually, that goes back so far because that's Mm -hmm. like in Shakespeare's time, same thing. Absolutely. And they would do the, um, I think I told you about this. They would do the, the bear, Mm -hmm. the bear fight. Mm Mm-hmm. It was fucking crazy. People were crazy People in that were point. crazy. This is what happens when you don't have Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> so women's boxing bouts were very rare and regarded more as exhibitions, uh, not professional fights, but more of like entertainment. It's like watch these ladies scratch at out. each other. Yeah. yeah. 
So Barbara was born in a village called uh, Cottingham in East Riding of Yorkshire, which is the northern part of England, in 1930. She lived in Cottingham till she was six, and her family moved to Hornsey on the coast. The three years I spent in Hornsey just before World War II were the best of my life, Barbara said. As a kid, I used to, in summer holidays, just go out on my own. A seven or eight-year-old walked down to the beach. I'd sit and watch the piers, and I knew every little twist and turn of Hornsey. I went to a very modern school with a very young teacher. It was mixed gender, too, which was not common in those days. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so she's kind of got, like, this nice little ocean, like seaside life and, you know, a progressive school. Uh, Barbara said that she mostly hung out with boys. Uh, they would fight each other. They would take turns hitting each other in the mouth. <laughs> Funzies. <laughs> For funsies. Um, some of it was like, uh, she felt confident she could handle herself. And there was like instances where like a boy would be kind of her same height and they would be like, you have to fight. Like kind of like what I was in the reads, you guys have to fight and you have to prove yourself. And it's like, they got nothing better to do. So of course they're going to knock each other's blocks. Do you, do you, have you watched that show? Um, oh, fuck. The one on uh, Hulu that's the seventh grade, the oh, two no. girls in seventh grade, no, but it's played I don't by have, the adult women. <laughs> I don't have Hulu. Oh my <laughs> God. What is the name of that? It's called, um, shit. I'm going to have to look it up right now. But the reason why I bring that up is because there's a scene where in the two best friends from the show, they're like her, like the one girl's brother is like, you guys have to fight. (laughs) You have, you you have to fight because there's a whole complicated story about it, but they like get to the like fight spot and they like kind of like slap hands a couple of times and then they're like, kick each other's shins. I don't want to do this. Do you want to do this? No, No, I don't want to do this. And then they like make up and decide not to fight. And the boys are all like, what the, they wanted to see a fight. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. God, I can't believe I can't remember this. This is why I have a brain. This is why I have brain lesions. <laughs> Whatever. I can't remember Amanda. the name of it. It's really good. <gasps> Anyways. <laughs> so uh, Barbara was actually introduced uh, to boxing through sheer chance. Except other than the fighting. <laughs> oh, well, the fighting in school. So in the late 1940s, she's about 17, 18 years old. Um, she's trying to get a team of girls together to play soccer. And girls were not even supposed to play soccer at this time. Ugh, yeah. And she said it was just as frowned upon as boxing. So after kicking the ball around um, in the muddy streets with her friends, she comes home and her mom is like, get those dirty shoes out my house. So she throws newspapers at the girls and says, wipe her shoes. And the newspaper falls down on the ground and it's face up. And there's a picture of this fairground boxer named Polly Faircloud. And she thought she, or actually she said out loud, don't, don't use that paper to wipe your shoes. And she takes it and she reads the article about Polly. And so, um, Polly is like this exhibition fighter and wrestler. And she actually has quite an extensive background too. But what she did was she would go to like fairs and you would set up like a booth and like you were saying, like, uh, let me shock put in any man who can throw further mm. than me. So she would do that. Like anybody want to box or wrestle and see who can beat me. They'd pay her money and they would do the exhibition. And it was like at the circus and at the fairgrounds. Uh, so she reads this article and she thinks, I'll give it a try. <laughs> this is like movie. Like, I, I want to write a script about this. <laughs> so her parents, surprisingly, but reluctantly, let her take up boxing. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> So she is able to get a job at the fairgrounds and she's working as um, in a booth like how Polly is. And she challenges women to fight her as a sideshow. Okay. (laughs) So she's like, you over there, can you fight me? You over there, can you fight me? Who can beat me? (laughs) And no one can beat her? Uh, I didn't know about that. (laughs) Maybe she might have gotten knocked down a couple times. So Barbara, too, she was only 4'11". And she was 98 pounds at this time. What? She was tiny. Yeah. She called herself the small but mean. <laughs> she earned enough the money. small but mean what? <laughs> just, <laughs> she was small but mean. Okay. Uh, she earned enough money to be able to purchase real boxing gear. She got herself a bag. She got gloves. She was able to get shoes. And she set it up in the backyard and like trained in her backyard. Um, she also bought a book of the art of self-defense. And she studied that. 
Um, after some time of developing her skills, uh, she headed to London in search of a trainer and a female sparring partner. Uh, she found a trainer. His name was Leonard Smith. He saw that she had skill and he was willing to work with her, which was shocking. Like he just saw her box and he's like, yeah, you got some talent. He's willing to do it. At a gym um, called Mickey Woods Gym, her coach, Leonard, which would later become her husband. Oh, Okay. Train, yeah. Maybe so there was some he, interest there. That's why he was willing to coach her. <laughs> he ended up training her for three hours every day. Whoa. Yeah. So even though she that's had a, a coach, so yeah, that's a lot of time boxing. Boxing yeah, like is exhausting. An exhausting sport. Yeah. So even though she had a coach, uh, she was highly criticized by people in the gym, people outside the gym. She even sometimes had confrontations with other fighters just to be able to walk through the door. They were like, you don't belong here. This is not for women. You're a little girl, blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, this is a quote from her. I said, it was all girls don't do this and girls don't do that. I was just interested in it and I figured I should be able to do what I want just the same as boys do. So That's she, a running theme with a lot of the women that we end up talking about. Is they like, just don't accept. I should be allowed to. So yeah. I'm going to. And they don't ask. Yeah. They, do. they don't ask permission. They yeah. just do it. So as hard as it was to find uh, a gym to work in, opponents were just as difficult to find, too. Yeah, I would imagine. Um, if, the, if the culture is you can't do that, then how are you going to find exactly. other people who do it? Well, British officials, too, refused to recognize female boxing as a profession. Uh, Barbara didn't let that stop her, though. She decided to fight in other countries, like France and um, other, other countries around her. So Barbara said she fought for the sheer love of the sport and the passion of competition, there was no glitter, there was no glamour, there was no hype, just a burning desire to prove herself against another woman in the ring. On occasions, on occasions, she would fight as many as 30 rounds a day. Oh my God, that's too many. That's too many. There's no regulations. So they're like, <laughs> <laughs> there's a, have you ever seen the movie Harlem Nights? Uh -uh, I haven't. Uh, Eddie Murphy and like Red Skelton and. But he's talking about this boxer, and it's it's a 1920s period movie, and he's like, I saw him fight 43 rounds once because <laughs> there was no regulations for boxing. Yeah. yeah. So she said, it was our job to put up the show, fight all day, and then pull it down again. Saturday nights, we would not go to bed. We would just get into the trucks, drive to the next city. It was very hard life, but it was really good training. Some sports writers wrote positively about her as a competitor, that she was fast. Uh, one thing they all said, like in the old articles about her, is that she was super fast. She was really, really quick. And she was so tiny, I can yeah. imagine. And also she was a southpaw too, which is a southpaw is you're leading with your right and you're leading with your right foot, which is uh, left-handed people usually hit with their right. I think that's what it is. Yeah, I was going to say it means that she's left-handed. Yeah. So other British newspapers condemned what she did. Um, actually, a newspaper wrote about her that she was an insult to womanhood. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, they felt that way about bicycles. So I imagine that boxing really put them over it's the edge. to yeah, it'd be a little, little too much. So hitting a wall in England... She decides that she wants to go to the U.S. The U.S. at the time was actually far more progressive in women's boxing. For once. For We're once in something. On something. Yeah. Right. So they had more freedom to do what they wanted there, and Barbara wanted that. So Barbara and her husband decided to move to the U.S. in 1952. They traveled around the U.S. state to state, taking fights along the way. She won her first eight bouts in a row. In 1954, Barbara was offered to fight Joanne Hagen of Indianapolis. At the time, Joanne was the U.S.'s women's boxing champion. And Barbara was uh, earned the nickname now in the ring was the Mighty Adam from London. A-T-O-M? Yeah, like a little, uh, like like a a little, little Adam. Adam. Okay, <laughs> like a little Adam bomb. Yeah. And so she was from London. She's this tiny, like, new fighter that's coming out, and she's going to go against the U.S., you know, women's boxing champion. It was a big deal, and they were really, like, hyping it up and sensationalizing it. So they actually decided to televise the fight, and it was the first ever uh, national televised fight uh, with women. Wow. Yeah. That's actually really impressive. Very. And cool. And that's interesting. That's super cool. So the um, it drew. I really do want to make a movie out of this woman's life. This one is cinematic <laughs> this because be it's good. got everything in it. We've got romance with the coach. We got 
we got this like cinematic moment when the pi- paper falls on the ground and then she sees her destiny. Like this is going to be a good Her movie. sad days at the fair trying to pick yes. fights with strangers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this event, uh, this boxing match drew 1,200 boxing uh, fans in an eight round bout by a decision by points, no KO, Joanne won, but Barbara did lose. Oh, bummer. Yeah, bummer. In the fight, Joanne said she had obvious advantage in weight, reach, and height, but she reported she had trouble overwhelming her quick and tenacious opponent. Opponent. Barbara earned great respect from her for this uh, fight because of her tenacity and her aggression in the ring. People were impressed with yeah. she brought it, you know, yeah. she didn't hold back. She was little, but she was mighty. <clears throat> yeah. There's actually some great... Uh, videos of her talking and she's just this little tiny thing with this kind of uh not so posh british accent and she's just (laughs) talking about how she likes to box um so a few years later in 1957 she moved to dallas texas on the 31st of august she fought and she knocked out the u.s bantamweight champion phyllis kugler this fight was significant i know who that woman is you know who phyllis kugler is i was going to do her oh Barbara knocked her out. (laughs) (laughs) This fight was significant in that it was the first time ever that a legal and official license had been granted for women to box. That's what made her the first official women's boxing champion. Oh. So her title brought her a place at the table at a legendary boxing gym called the Fifth Street Boxing Gym in Miami, Florida. When she began training training there, she met a hopeful and confident boxer. His name was Muhammad Ali. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, she said he was Cassius Clay back then, and he was just starting out. He was just a young lad. He was very sure of himself. <laughs> <laughs> no shit. <laughs> yeah. So Barbara had a remarkable record by that time. She had fought over a thousand exhibitions with men and women. She had 18 pro fights under her belt with women and only one loss. And that opponent was about a foot taller than her and 30 pounds heavier than her. Was that the one with Barbara or whatever? No, this um, was another one. Okay. Or no, that that was the one. Yes. In 1959 in what was said to be the first, it says the first recorded female fight in Florida. I don't know what that means. First recorded. Maybe like documented recorded for the radio. I don't know. I don't know. I was thinking recorded like, I was like, did they videotape it? But they didn't have videotapes. <laughs> <laughs> well, they had television. So the, yeah. yeah, they did. Well, this is 1959. It's the first recorded female fight in Florida. And Barbara fought Gloria Adams at the North Miami Armory. After that fight in 1960, Barbara became pregnant with her first child. She hung up her gloves with a final professional record of 30 wins and one loss. She remained active in the boxing community, and in 1993, she ended up founding and becoming the president of the Women's International Boxing Federation. The federation aids in the regulation of women's boxing, establishing titles for women's, women to fight for, establishing weight classes, and proper care and pay for female boxers. Does it still exist? It still exists. Cool. In 2010, she was the first and the only woman to be introduced into the Florida Boxing Hall of Fame. And in 2012, she was able to go back home to London and she watched women's boxing for the Olympics in 2012. So she got to go home and she got to see actual like women being able to compete in the Olympics in boxing. Uh, The winner that year was Nicola Adams. She won the flyweight gold for Great Britain that year. And she was the first woman to do so. And she was also a woman of color, which is really cool. Barbara was there and she watched her fight. Yeah, that legacy. Yeah. Uh, in 2014, she was in, elected to the International Boxing and Wrestling Hall of Fame. She appeared in a Nike ad with her hands wrapped and a towel around her head. And the caption read, in Barbara's day, you had to fight just to be in the ring. Huh. And so if you believe in something, fight for it. So Barbara admitted she never thought women's boxing would come this far. And she would still like to have further recognition for women's boxing and purses to be increased. At 87 years old, she's still at the gym. What? She's coaching. She's, yeah, she's still there. She's still working at it. So today she is a mother of two children. She's a grandmother of four, and she resides in Miami Beach, Florida. Barbara was and is a true pioneer in women's boxing, which I thought was 
so cool. <laughs> she is a yeah. badass. She is. There's and she's a... still alive, which I think is really cool. I yeah. love it when people are still alive. Yeah. And she, it shows her like in the ring and she's like with these like big muscly, you know, boxer guys. And she's like kicking their feet. So they'll have like proper stance and stuff. <laughs> We got to post videos of her. Oh, it's there is um, a lot of videos. One of the videos I, I liked in particular was um, Barbara, a life in boxing, which is available on YouTube. Um, I went to the actual international women's boxing federation.com. There's a lot of information there about how it got started. And then also about just what's going on currently in women's boxing, which I don't know a whole lot. So if you want to go and look and see who's doing what, or who's up and coming, go ahead and take a look there. Um, I went to bbc.com. Interv- uh, I took a lot from an interview she had with vice.com, a history of women's boxing.com, and a little bit from Wikipedia. I forgot to say where I got my info from. Huh. <laughs> Let me find it. <laughs> Here we are. Um, I did use Wikipedia for Helen Stevens, but I, I used the... Um, Missouri, the state um, historic website. I use Biography and Britannica, Sports Illustrated, and a manuscript that I found from the Show Me State um, Olympic stuff. (laughs) I did forget to say a quote from her. Um, It was from that video I was telling you about. She says, I think the idea that girls can't box is old fashioned. Anyhow, my boyfriend doesn't mind. Why should I? (laughs) <laughs> Wait, when was that when did she say that she said that when she was around like 19 20 years old oh that's great my yeah. boyfriend is a mine so why, why should, should you, you? <laughs> <laughs> that's great i love yeah. i love that we talked about women athletes today and by accident and then it was all like full circle yeah i can't wait to show you how tiny she was man but she she was feisty she packed a little punch i mean 30 wins and one loss and yours was tiny and mine was huge. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just shows it doesn't matter. But they were both fast. Exactly. 50 yard dash in 11 seconds. <laughs> A thousand exhibitions. Oh my God. <laughs> 30 rounds of boxing. Can't oh, thank you. I get winded just trying to do, you know, a minute and a half of jabs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that was a good, good little uh, program we have today. Yeah. I enjoyed our athletes. I did too. Yeah. I think we um, did them justice. Did them justice. Yeah. And I do want to see a movie made about Barbara. <laughs> I think her movie is, her life is cinematic for sure. I'll contact her right away <laughs> and get on that <laughs> screenplay. <laughs> thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, we want to thank once again, our editor, Lucas McIntyre, who's part of the tourist union and also does solo music all around Spokane. You can check him out online. And we'd also like to thank Jennifer Finch of L7 for being gracious enough to provide us with the theme music, which is the song Shirley Shirley. on L7's Hungry for Stink album. And they just put out a brand new album and they are on tour currently. Look for them in your city. Awesome. Thanks for listening, guys. Catch us next time.